Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to be getting started very shortly. I'm just I'm looking at the participant number. I'm just letting it climb up to a critical mass, and then we'll get started very shortly. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to what may be our sixth, seventh, eighth webinar and a series of webinars that has revolved around either the CARES Act or the pandemic or both. I will say I'm very excited about today's topic and our esteemed group of panelists. However, before I do any more talking, let me get this disclaimer on the table and out the way. While all of our panelists are attorneys, they will be discussing the law generally and nothing in the webinar should be considered as legal advice attendees should consult their own legal advisor to address their own unique circumstances. Okay, so now that I've got out the way, let's uh, get into it. So today's topic is private equity firms and the pandemic, key players, key concerns, and tough decisions. So just to give you all an overview of what we're gonna talk about in this next hour, I'm first gonna give uh, panelists introductions, and then I'm gonna give a quick private equity overview, just for some of us who may be less familiar with how private equity works, just a quick primer to make sure we're all calibrated on the same page. And then we'll get into the content, which will be very interesting. What our panelists have is they did a COVID-19 impact survey, and the gist of their talk is going to revolve around the results of that, that survey. So it's, 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 it's a lot about how the private equity industry is managing in this COVID-19 environment. So that'll be very interesting. And so the gist is gonna be what, what they found. And then we're gonna get into some question and answer. You all can feel free to type in your answers. We've had some, we, we have some questions that were sent in in advance. And as we move through the presentation, if things come to mind, go ahead and type in your questions and we'll do the best we get to them. So that's our agenda, that's our game plan, that's our overview. Oh, and also we have some more webinars coming up and we'll get to that at the end of the, uh, end of, end of the webinar for today. So first let's introduce our panelists. So first we have Sharmila Kassam. Sharmila is an attorney. She's a business professional and institutional investor. Before joining Michael Best, Shar was deputy chief investment officer for the employees retirement system of Texas, where she led investment planning and strategy by co-managing a nearly $30 billion multi-asset class portfolio. Sharmila has over a decade of experience in the investment industry, and prior to that, 15 years of experience in the corporate and venture industry. Sharmila received her bachelor's in accounting and her JD from the University of Texas. We're doing our best not to hold that against her, but you know, it is what it is. Next, we've got Marianne Scott Dwight. Uh, Ms. Dwight, she was raised in South Texas, she is a strategic business advisor and former institutional investor with experience in guiding investment managers and businesses utilizing good financial practices and good governance in a more efficient manner to maximize their return. As a former institutional investor, Ms. Dwight is working with managers on ways to make their business more efficient and resilient, including focusing on good governance principles and developing ESG programs. Finally, we have Jayothi. Oh, look, okay. I'm working in technology. That's Mary Ann. All right. I'm with that. Okay. Let me catch up. All right. There we go. Finally, we've got Jayothi Agarwala. Jayothi is a senior private markets business development professional with 20 plus years of experience raising capital for small emerging impact and diverse private asset managers. Jayothi is a registered representative with Profar Securities LLC. She serves as an advisor to public and private asset managers Integrating, integrating ESG and impact. Ms. Agarwala received her MBA in finance from Bentley University and her BA in economics with honors from Delhi University. So please join me in welcoming our esteemed panelists. I know there's virtual clapping going on and all that good stuff. So let's get right to it. So just a quick overview to get our arms around the scope of private equity in Texas. There's some 703,000 workers in private equity here in Texas. 
ranked only second to California, who has, I think, 1.1 million or thereabouts. The average salary for private equity workers is $78,000 annually. And in terms of uh, assets, at equity activity, uh, it's been steadily rising. We've got $72.25 billion in equity in 2017. In 2018, that number has risen to $110.62 billion. So we have a fairly robust and vibrant private equity activity here in the state of Texas. Finally, I'm gonna give a quick overview. So for some of you who don't live and breathe this stuff on a daily basis, so this overview is just to help us all stay calibrated as our panelists sort of walk and talk through their discussion. So when we look at private equity, we're, dealing, we're essentially dealing with three basic components. First, we've got the investors, and they're gonna be referred to as either institutional investors or wealthy individuals. When we're talking about institutional investors, we're talking about insurance companies, pension funds, hedge funds, university endowments, mutual funds, those types of entities. And then our wealthy individuals could any, be anybody, Jerry Jones, Oprah Winfrey, individuals with a lot of money, all right? I'm not an equity fund investor, probably not gonna happen anytime soon. Then we've got the fund managers. So these investors, they put their money with the fund managers. They're referred to as private equity firms, fund managers, or the general partners. Our parents will refer to them in any number of three, any number of these three, just so we can keep our bearings on what's, what's happening. So these private equity managers, they take their money from the investors and they put them in what we call our portfolio companies. These are, they cross all types of industries and technologies and so forth. The common thing being they are privately held and they are owned by the fund managers. So that's the general dynamic, that's the general layout. And so as we go through the discussion, when our panelists are speaking, it's gonna be about any one of these three, just so we can keep our eye on the ball. So with that, I am going to pass the baton over to our panelists and I will let them take over with the discussion. Thank you all for joining us. And oh, oh so our first is, is Sharmila. She's gonna get us started. Go ahead, Sharmila, you got the floor. Thank you, and I sincerely have to say that since you're including a Longhorn in this discussion. So uh, forgive me for, for having to gone through the rival school. Um, as a point of uh, clarity here, the, the survey that we're using as a basis for this conversation was actually conducted by ILPA or the Institutional Limited Partners Association. And the reason we were using that is because it's an industry trade organization that um, includes most many of the institutional investors as well as some of the family offices in the industry. It's a large trade association with 500 members representing about $2 trillion. It's global. There's about 5,000 individual members across 50 countries and overall can represent about half the global PE that's managed. Uh, the survey was a nice basis. It was conducted kind of in the initial outs, um, onstart of the pandemic, um, but it touched on a lot of the concerns that we're going to elaborate on, not just from the survey results, but also from just experience um, that each of us have, as well as the you know, discussions that we've had with stakeholders in the industry. So let me start off with um, the obvious, I think, that people would expect um, to happen at this you know, juncture is investor liquidity and the allocations that investors have to private equity. Um, the survey itself talked about results showing over 60% um, expected some liquidity concerns. Some were significantly concerned and some were just modest checking their private equity allocations. For institutional investors, it's an interesting time um, compared to say 10, 12 years ago when we were looking at the, the GFC. Um, institutions like pensions and others have been increasing their allocations to private markets. And so some have suggested that this will be a different dynamic than say in 2008, 2009 where their allocations were lower and they were willing to invest more, take advantage of that opportunity. There of course were institutions that were highly invested in the private market, so it all depends on the organization. But what institutions are concerned about is obviously the liquidity they need for the benefit payments as well as how their private equity is a percentage of their overall um, assets being managed. So it's often called the denominator effect, but when there's a sharp correction, obviously in the public markets, the overall assets go down and then private equity 
um, usually in the institutional world, has certain bans or targets that their governing board set. So there's some concern amongst institutions about whether they're going to exceed those targets. For the wealthy individuals, um, many of them have not participated in private equity um, in the same context, like through funds. So it may be an interesting dynamic to see play out. And I've um, anecdotally heard about it on the real estate side, where more family offices and retail and uh, institution investors are actually participating in the private markets. Um, and then you have the added uh, kind of tailwind of recently uh, more opportunity for private equity in retirement plans with the Department of Labor allowing for um, those type of investments in your 401k. Um, so LPs are trying to be very cautious right now and look to see where they most want to be in the private equity. A lot of them may be slowing down or um, circling around existing relationships, but that's going to be an interesting opportunity for the institutional investors to be more selective. And um, as you hear discussions going forward, you'll hear more about the manager perspective and then obviously it trickles down to the portfolio companies. So that, that takes me to the next point is how this um, allocation of private equity is going to be deployed. And so there is um, questions as there were during the GFC about the change in capital calls. So again, to level set, like Professor Newman was talking about, so you've got investors who make commitments to funds that are 10 plus year life. Um, what the manager of that fund will do will call capital as they have investments they wanna make. So those investment periods over which they'll call capital range from three to five years, depending upon the strategy. So the question becomes, will the capital start being called in quicker than may, maybe an investor wants to see, especially if they're trying to manage liquidity needs. Um, initial survey results from what the investors um, for ILPA survey said is that they did see some changes in that capital call um, pacing. There, you know, there's a little less visibility sometimes, and I think that's going to be challenged by some of these larger investors from why the general partners are calling in capital. Um, some are calling in, obviously, to do investments, but as as Marianne will talk about with how deal flow is going to work on the manager side, um, that deal flow may be slowing down, particularly as there's some uncertainty with the healthcare crisis in the macroeconomic environment. Um, other reasons for calling in capital is we've already got um, managers that have credit lines, which I'll discuss a little more in detail, that may be trying to free up some capital um, so that, that they have um, more opportunity to invest in these portfolio companies. So let me jump now to those subscription lines, which are these short-term lines of credit that general partners use. Now that differs from a portfolio company that may have its own uh, lines of credit. And from what we're seeing in the industry, um, portfolio companies are obviously trying to leverage that. Fund managers are trying to support them in managing cash flow as much as possible at that portfolio company level. And Jyoti will talk more about that. On, from a manager standpoint, and this can become a very long discussion, but I'm going to try to hit sort of the highlights, is the, the history has been in probably the last five years that those credit lines, which were typically short term in nature, um, the purpose of which was to help managers more efficiently manage cash so that they didn't have to call in capital from investors um, too often. So it was more of a pacing um, method, uh, methodology, if you will. And many of them had maxed those credit lines. And so now the question becomes, um, do they need to free up some of that capital for some uncertainty in the future? Or are they um, going to continue to maximize um, those, those leverage uh, on the portfolios? And I think a question came in prior um, when, and during the registration about sort of the concerns about leverage in this industry. Obviously, private equity is a highly leveraged asset class, but there's obviously going to be some um, review by investors as well as, I think, a differentiator for managers in terms of how they use leverage because um, the uncertainties of the current pandemic are going to lend themselves to having to be very prepared for whatever could come next. And then finally, since we are talking um, uh, amongst uh, some legal practitioners, as well as trying to um, inform others about sort of how legal considerations are taken into account, the pandemic, like it did in during the GFC, will probably make investors as well as managers talk about certain terms and alignment in the uh, partnership agreement. I referenced the organization survey that we were we're discussing right now, ILPA, and um, they've been much of a catalyst in terms of 
talking about how that alignment can be revisited. There was a lot of work done post GFC where um, ILPA actually issued principles that came from discussions between investors and managers. Uh, I can see that with as much fundraising that has happened in the recent years, those alignment of terms often have kind of um, gotten away from the investors. And so um, there will probably be more discussions, especially on the use of leverage, the use of short term credit lines, um, the visibility and the reporting of how investors are going to be interacting with general partners in terms of overseeing portfolios and hope to get more into that discussion um, as we have questions both from the panel and from Professor Newman. So let me pause here and um, let's move to where the manager's impact and concerns are. Marianne. Yes, thank you, Shar, and thank you, Professor Newman. Um, so I'm going to talk about the fund manager, or as we also is uh, referred to in the industry as the general partner. Um, having had worked with um, over 200 general partners in my uh, previous role, um, and during the, the great financial crisis, COVID, uh, and what's happened as a result of this pandemic has created some um, similar, but also some very different concerns. And I'm going to talk about those today. And one of the first ones I want to talk about is fundraising. Uh, and I want to also point out um, that uh, this is, we're talking about the private placement of securities. So we're not just going out there and buying a public security. We're not buying Nike stock. We're not buying uh, Apple, um, wherein you can just go and uh, you do it yourself and you can do it through a broker. What we're talking about is the private placement of securities. And under the securities laws, with the private placement of securities, you cannot market. You can't um, go out there and market the same way as you can, uh, and you don't have everything out there as you do if you're doing a public security. Uh, you have to be very careful about how you um, how you uh, obtain your investors. And so, as a result of COVID and what's happened, um, that has put a very huge um, kink, if you will, and create a big challenge to managers in their fundraising activities. Because as a result of, of COVID, as we all know, we're not able to travel or we're traveling in a very limited manner. And so managers, in order to go and meet and establish the relationships with the potential investors, with their institutional investors, the endowments, um, the pensions, uh, or the high net worth individuals, they're not able to do that. Uh, and they're not able to meet them face to face. They're gonna have to do it in a different way. They're gonna have to do that through what we're doing today. And that is through a Zoom or something very similar. But it's a whole different, the, the entire industry of how managers interact with the potential investors and, and, uh, and how they establish relationships has been upended. So the, typically they will go, go to conferences, they will have meetings, they will have dinners. Uh, they do it in a multitudinous of ways. And the, all each of those ways is not available at this moment. So managers have had to pivot. They've had to use technology. But even then, institutional investors and other investors are wary because they are not meeting them face to face. That's how that's been the human way. That's been the way that business has been conducted, and now we're going to have to look at it differently. So that is one of the one of the first things I wanted to talk about. Uh, it has to do with the fact of um, fundraising and travel and developing relationships. The second thing I want to talk about has to do with the GP or the manager outlook and commitment pacing. Now, Shark talked a little bit about that um, um, earlier. And I want to talk a, a little bit about this right now, because as a result also of the pandemic, there seems to be um, a lot of uh, managers out there, a lot of private equity firms, um, but, they're, uh, a, but they are in competition. There's a, a huge competition and they're not able to compete, as I said before, in the marketplace in the same way as they have before. And so one of the things that, that uh, um, these managers have to have to do is they have to try to differentiate differentiate themselves uh, during this pandemic. And how do they do that? They're going to do that in a, this Zoom environment. They're going to try to differentiate differentiate themselves, and that becomes a little bit more difficult. Additionally, um, this is they 
they also are gonna have to try to determine what the market's gonna be like. And as, we, as we've experienced to date, it's, and what I think we're gonna experience in the future, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. It's not gonna be linear. Uh, it's not gonna kind of grow up. It's gonna be up and down and up and down. And so that's one of the things that, that uh, these managers are gonna to have to be, they're gonna to have to be able to pivot. They're gonna to have to also be able to have to work with their investors because they, they may have to have some uh, amendments or changes to their strategy. And so it's, gonna, it's posing for them some different, they're gonna to have to look at different ways of doing their business. Additionally, um, as the managers are looking at these portfolio companies and how they're, how they're going to choose portfolio companies, how they're gonna monitor them, how they screen them, is also a challenge in this environment. And so that is gonna be a different, they're gonna to have to do it this in a different way. They're gonna to have to employ uh, maybe some more market research instead of some individual meetings. And um, they're gonna to have to do some, use some other tools to conduct their own due diligence when they are trying to then make an investment. Uh, and so that may take more time. As a result, when, when, an, when an investor makes a commitment to a manager, they, um, and the manager wants to call money, they're not gonna call for that capital, you know, before they can actually commit that money and to buy a portfolio company or to uh, invest in a portfolio company, as it were. And so that timing is a little, as I would say, from a legal perspective, cattywampus right now. It is very, it's difficult right now to, to actually judge when, they're at, when they um, call for the money and when they actually need the money, because sometimes it may come quicker than they think, or it may take longer because of the fact of how they're gonna have to conduct the due diligence and engage in these uh, conversations and negotiations with these portfolio companies. And so um, that takes me to kind of my, my third point that I wanna talk about today. And that is the GP and manager communication. So partly uh, in this, you know, it is as a fiduciary, the general partner, the fund manager should be, should, has a responsibility to, the, to, the, to those that they invest money for. And so it becomes kind of a, also another timing issue as to when and to, and how much uh, should, would they say as to what's gonna happen as a result of COVID. So as I've talked about uh, uh, up to this point, is that COVID is impacting their ability uh, to fundraise, their ability to commit the money, and so their ability to do some of the due diligence but how, and also their ability to monitor and help these portfolio companies in this time of crisis. And so what should they say and when should they say it? Uh, the investors, they want total transparency. They wanna know even before anything happens that it's going to happen. Well, we know that that's not practical, but there's gotta be a, you know, some middle ground in there. We also know that the portfolio companies need to have some direct communication as to how the manager can help their needs and how they can help them through this crisis. And then there's a third leg to this, and that's the regulators, because the regulators want to know ahead of time, or at least as soon as possible, when, when there's gonna be an impact on that manager in, in, in actually acting as a fiduciary and being able to follow what they said they're gonna do in their limited partnership agreements and their other agreements with their investors. So communication, I think at this time, is becoming even more important. And, and I think managers are taking stock right now. I've, been, I've had several managers who've asked me, when should I say it and how much should I say? Should I say, we think that if the rents don't come in next month, that, we, that it could really impact us to the point that we might only have another six months run rate, um, but we don't know that for sure. And so uh, how much should you say uh, when you don't know for sure? And again, as I said before, it's a bumpy ride, but we know that there's gonna be some bumps. We don't know the depth and the breadth of those bumps. And so I think that's when we really have to be very close and be as transparent as possible but also given that this is um, something that 
it could we, they could have some help they could uh, get some resources and that's something that Jothi will talk about later and one of the last things i want to talk about are the legal provisions and so shard referred to, uh, to this earlier uh, and from the manager's perspective and because of the fact that they they may need some more time and within which to uh, commit the money within which to make some investments they may need to go back to their investors and they may need to amend the agreements with those investors uh, like uh, their limited partnership agreements for example they may need to amend that and add more time within the in which to invest the money or in extend the investment period as it were they may need some more time or they may need to add some strategy they may have a very specific amount of what they can invest in and because of the fact that healthcare and the making of masks for example have become a, at a premium right now they may need to amend their agreements to allow them to do that uh, and so I think those are some things that they they are going to have to work very closely with their investors um, they may also in, in which Shar was talking about um, which is the debt the leverage ratio uh, since the financial crisis, many of the um, fund managers in these agreements allow them to have maybe a 75-25 or, excuse me, or a, you know, 70-30 uh, leverage ratio. But, but given this environment and the ability to go to banks and to borrow money in order to invest in, in, in a particular portfolio company may be more difficult. And so they may need to put more equity in and less leverage, which to the investor might be a good might be a good thing for them actually but i think those are some discussions back to the communication those are some discussions i think that the managers should be also happening with their institutional investors and at this time i think that i will pause uh, and then i will let uh, josie speak more uh, particularly about the portfolio companies um, thank you, Marianne. And as um, Marianne and Shar have been talking about different impact um, both at the limited partner level and as well as at the general partner fund level. I'm now going to address some of those same concerns around leverage, around fundraising with portfolio companies. Um, and we are talking about companies that are backed by private equity. And just for a moment, I wanna digress and talk about what are the return drivers really for uh, private equity? It starts with business fundamentals, and then you hopefully you can get a discount to your peers in your valuation when you acquire that company, which is generally controlled. And the third thing is your ability to add value as a fund manager. And lastly, it's the leverage. So when we look at company valuations, the first thing we look at is the impact of the pandemic on um, certain industries. So many industries have faced a positive impact. And these, as we know, we're on Zoom. So certainly productivity tools, communication tools, uh, internet, e-commerce, um, personal healthcare, medical supplies, food processing services. Those are some of the industries that have actually benefited from the pandemic. On the losers, it's also quite obvious. We're not traveling as much as Marianne said. So tourism, leisure, aviation and maritime, no more cruises, automotives as well. People don't have any place to go. And of course, obvious things like construction, real estate, manufacturing, but also financial services, education. I know many of you have kids at home and I'm sure even the law school had to um, shut down for the summer and make other arrangements. And, and, and this is closest to my heart, what's suffering are the arts. I'm in New York, all of Broadway, all of the Metropolitan Opera, museums, everything is shuttered. So that's one thing to look at. But again, when we look um, at uh, relating back to both what um, Marianne and Shar were talking about earlier, from a company perspective, they really have to see how much cash do they have on hand to continue their operations. Um, and yes, private equity firms, uh, as well as companies have been eligible to get some of the pandemic uh, fiscal stimulus, like the payroll protection plan, we could talk about that later, but really liquidity has become 
primary in um, managing the business because you remember earlier pre-pandemic the focus was really on growing the business on looking at the drivers for EBITDA on looking at uh, new markets looking at competition but the focus now is on liquidity this is unusual because there's both a supply and a demand shock and we're not sure as we get back into uh, the you know, opening up again whether consumer behavior is going to continue to be the same um, i know for one thing that um, you know i realized i don't i need less and i'm able to do a lot more who knows if i'll go back to eating in a restaurant again but certainly enjoying my home cooking Leverage is uh, an element that both Shar and Marianne talked about, and rescue financing, particularly is, as you know, that in um, the middle part of the life cycle of a general partner holding a portfolio company, they want to focus on debt reduction. So depending on where in that investment cycle you are, some of those portfolio companies may have been talking to their bankers about uh, re uh, you know, either paying down the debt or uh, changing the terms. So that is one issue to look at. And then, of course, the financial health of the business versus the interest coverage and the covenants. Um, again, both Marianne and Shar touched upon that. Um, more, um, you know, realistic, and this I think is relevant for everyone, not just for the portfolio companies, is the transition to remote work. Some of the issues that come up here are privacy and data security. As you know, it's uh, health privacy. Do you go disclose to your um, uh, employer that somebody in your family um, has had COVID or you've had COVID-19 and uh, whether or not you uh, should disclose that to everybody at work? Data security on the other side, working remotely. Um, as we're talking about law school and lawyers. We have a lot of sensitive information. Who else is in your home office who is able to uh, access that information, and not only that, what a, do you have encrypted software? Um, and lastly, do you have listening devices like um, Google Home or Alexa listening into your conversations around sensitive matters at home? Health and safety is no longer just about construction companies or mining or oil and gas. It is really everyday health and safety whether you are working from home or you're going to your office when it reopens, what are some of the infrastructure that uh, companies are thinking of and to be COVID compliant. And um, again, legal issues come up here because you have to be COVID compliant for the health and safety of your employees, um, not only based on federal regulation, but also state and city regulation. Um, and those are some of the factors to look at. Um, remote and office work environment infrastructure will have to change. I, I saw a, a recent press release from Amazon saying that they were going to invest $4 billion um, in redoing their infrastructure so that it is COVID compliant. So um, these are some of the factors that companies are having to look at. And I have to iterate both from uh, what Shar and Marianne talked about, that the communication, this is a partnership. That's why it says it's a limited partner, it's a general partner, and the companies and the managements of those companies in these control buyouts have to communicate. They have to be able to talk to their general partners about their financing needs, get help on their um, debt requirements, and also manage the business and see new opportunities. So with that, I think we are ready to open up with Q and A's and I'm going to um, pass it back to um, you, Neil. Thank you, Jelty. So fantastic discussion. And again, to our participants, you are free to chime in with questions. I do have some questions as I was listening and um, Again, I'm gonna I'm gonna put these questions generally, and and I would invite any of the three of you to weigh in as you seem appropriate. So I want to start with. So again, we've, again, everybody, I put this up here because I need this reference point so I can keep track of everything. So that's what I'm looking at. 
um, I'm looking at this um, chart up in the corner, the Q and A. So, so, so Marianne, you talked about, you focused on the um, fund manager, the journal partner. And one of the things you talked about was this, this communication dynamic. And what really struck me was, <clears throat> you know, I see this private equity dynamic is, is, is on the speculative side to begin with. But then when you add this COVID-19 overlay, I mean, it's just really a time of uncertainty. And you talked about this delicate balance of what you tell the investors, how that communication works. But there are just a lot of questions that cannot be answered because this we just don't know. We don't know what's going to happen with this pandemic. And so we don't know exactly how that's going to play out with the portfolio companies and everything else. So I, my question is, what exactly, because like you said, the, the, the investors, they want as much certainty as they can get in this type of a situation, but they can't get it. So can you talk a little bit more, and, and all three of you, to the extent you can weigh in, what are those conversations like when you've got the investors seeking to get as much information as possible and the fund managers just don't have it? Is that creating more tension or are, is everybody in this space understanding? How is that playing out? Well, um, I'll start off and, and then um, the rest of you, I know y'all have some you know, examples of this, but in the past, um, there's always been this dynamic or tension, if you will, between the manager and the investor vis-a-vis information and transparency. The, especially given, especially in the context within which um, I worked previously, which is a public entity. Transpa we wanted as much transparency as possible, but if we got it, then the manager was worried about the fact that it would be subject to the public funds invest, I mean, to the uh, Texas Public Investment Act. So it would be, um, it would be a FOIA type concern for um, the managers, they, they didn't want their secret sauce, if you will, everywhere. They didn't want all the details about the portfolio companies out uh, in the public domain. Uh, so there's always been, and there's always been this natural tension in that regard. Um, the manager also has, um, has, you know, certain fees and expenses and they're allowed to, to, you know, um, charge X amount for their widgets, their offices, and then how they conduct their business. And then also when they serve on the boards of these portfolio companies, and that has been another area of tension between, um, their investors, uh, and, um, the manager themselves. But in this, in this COVID environment, I think it, it poses kind of an interesting paradigm in this natural tension, if you will, between managers uh, and their investors in, in, with transparency. And that is because then no one has the eight ball. So no one knows for sure what's gonna happen or how it's gonna happen. And what this impacts in the day to day is how do they value the portfolio companies? When should they write them down? Should they write them down? And if they do, how much should they write down? Um, are they gonna get that PPP loan? Maybe not because they may not qualify. Are they gonna get some other financing? Um, so how much, what should we say when becomes I think even more of an, of an issue at that point. Uh, and I'll just leave it there because I know that Char and Jothi have some, something to say about this issue. So I'm happy to chime in. I think from the investor standpoint, um, you're right that there's a lot of uncertainty and the investors are fully aware of that. They have governing boards that sometimes they have to, if, especially on the institutional side, they may have to answer to and why you know, the allocations to private equity are what they are. Um, one of the things to take into account is that you probably have a spectrum of people in terms of the way they wanna hear communication. Um, Anecdotally, I've talked to investors who are managing large programs that want their managers to kind of give them sort of risk management. How many of the companies are going to be able to survive? How many of the companies, to Jyothi's point, are maybe thriving because they're in sectors that are getting a tailwind because of this? And how are they going to be managing sort of cash flow and stability and sort of aspects of their business that, you know, may not have been as an uh, area of focus, supply chains, um, dynamics within the industries that the companies already deal with, especially if their industry is 
part of the you know shutdown um, in different you know regions. I think other investors may be looking at this as a way for managers to differentiate themselves in terms of the amount of information they give and the quality of that information. I mean, I don't think anybody is really unrealistic in the sense that anyone will know all the answers. But those managers that uh, some of us have talked to have started to be very proactive early on. And so when things were starting um, early on in China with the pandemic, we know managers that were calling, trying to help with supply chains with their portfolio companies. So some of that to, to points that have already been mentioned where private equity is already a competitive industry and this challenge is going to highlight perhaps the, the types of managers that are distinguishing themselves based on how they're handling this current situation. But I think a lot of that revolves on sort of everything from risk management to just the quality of communications to an idea of where money is going to be called and how it's going to be used. Because there's also going to be opportunities where money should be deployed in distressed and opportunistic situations. And I think mentioned comments have already been made about managers maybe pivoting they need to for certain strategies. Um, yeah, and just uh, putting on my fundraising hat, that is what I do every day, um, and echoing both what Marianne and Shar had talked about. What we see in the um, GP communications is this great opportunity for leadership that a lot of the general partners have. And the leadership to communicate not only with their um, companies and portfolio companies and to be able to help them in places where um, they may not have those systems in place, but also importantly to communicate with um, their limited partners. Some best practices that I have seen some of the managers do is immediately, you know, like we talked about, there's a lag in reporting. So you're not going to get, the, the reporting comes every quarter. There's some uh, folks who've just said a quick back of the envelope, positive, negative, you know, the, the, our companies, uh, these are the companies in our portfolio, and these are the sectors that are most hit. So we're likely to have some impact. We don't know for sure. The um, second thing is to, um, really talk about is it been like some of the things I mentioned in the presentation, the supply chain or the demand. Is it on the, the shock? Is it on the demand side? Is it in the supply? So a quick, you know, positive or negative. And I find that this kind of uh, communication, when you don't really have hard numbers, you don't really know what the macro environment is. I've been working with a lot of uh, managers that are also in different markets, not just in the US and there are different conditions, the government conditions are different for, for, for the pandemic, the rules are different. You know that you know, some Europe is now back open, but the US isn't, and how many of your companies operate overseas or how many of them are overseas and what are the different conditions? These are all things that are really worthy of you know, quickly on the back of the envelope saying, okay, we, we, we don't know, but here's what we think that we should focus on. And, um, you know, so it, there is a whole bunch of things. And uh, going back to the communication, you know, having uh, just a limited part, a quick letter going out saying, um, yes, uh, we, we have been affected. We don't know exactly what that impact is going to be, but uh, we've put in a plan, place our business continuity plan. All of our, everything is well here at the fund all of our employees are working remotely. We have the secure systems in place and the infrastructure to continue managing. That's very important basic information to communicate to your limited partners as the companies are also communicating to their general partners. Got it. Thanks, JLP. Okay. Um, I see some questions in the queue and I, we, are, we're, we see them and I, we will get to them. Um, so I'm going to throw this out there. Um, so I'm looking at the dynamic between the fund manager slash general partner and the portfolio companies. And I'm going to give my layman's perspective of it and y'all can tweak me and correct me. <laughs> but it seems to me, uh, when this pandemic started, it seems to me fund managers, what you have in, from my assessment is you've got portfolio companies in all different states. You know, they've been affected 
in various various ways, as you said, based on the type of industry, what they do, and so forth. And so, my assessment is that has put a, a lot of um, onus on the fund managers and how they are dealing, how to manage their portfolio of companies. You know, it's almost like triage in some ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you all can share sort of, and, and so what I'm seeing is really good fund managers may be distinguishing themselves as they manage their portfolio through this pandemic and others not as skilled may be falling behind or we may be seeing some deficit there if they're not as facile in managing this pandemic and managing their portfolio company through this pandemic. I was wondering what, what you all would have to say about that and what observations you have. If I'm making sense with my question. You are. And Jyothi, maybe you start or whomever. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I think you're absolutely right, Neil, that um, it is a question of how that general partner is managing the different portfolio companies and how they're communicating with their portfolio companies. But not only that, you know, they have to also look at um, what is, um, their own company, what is the, the best practices within their own companies, you know, um, wh whether all of the, the, the investment team, the operating partners, the bankers, you know, the lawyers, all of their service providers, uh, the th third party audit. And I think we touched upon this a little bit earlier in when Marianne was talking that um, from a legal perspective, things are going to slow down because you're not able to travel to see, um, do the due diligence. And when you do have to invest, you need to get uh, all your lawyers together. You need to have all the audits. You need your bankers. It's uh, not an easy process. So the GP will have to take the leadership here. And um, I don't know, Marianne or Shar. Or yeah, I'll chime in too. I think um, when you specifically speak to triaging and with the portfolio managers, you know, they're going to have to make tough decisions. And that's part of what we want to touch on here too. Um, I, I anecdotally have seen managers who've had to look at their portfolios and see how they may um, actually make some exits earlier than they wanted to, or um, actually structure some secondary transactions for companies that they still think have more promise in terms of uh, valuation potential and appreciation, but because they need to reinvest the funds in those companies that are struggling in those um, industries as Jyothi mentioned, are um, having more of a, a headwind. So it'll be interesting to see because a manager now has this tough decision about trying to manage the entirety of its portfolio, but also how that is done will differentiate itself in performance which they're going to have to live with going forward. And um, I mean, Jyothi can speak very much to the fundraising. When, you know, when you've done all the right things, but your numbers aren't there, it's very difficult, even with all the explanations of what the, the pandemic created. So right. um, there, there will be some interesting transactions structured because of it. And there will also be some hard decisions that managers are going to have to make. And the way they communicate those to investors will be um, very crucial. Sorry, Mary. And I think, Shar, on yeah. that point, um, it, there's, there's a difference between a fund manager who has a legacy portfolio and has, is fighting fires, whereas a fund manager who is a first time manager, and I want to put a plug in for, and again, this is not a recommendation, again, that I'm going back to the disclaimer, but you can see emerging managers, they're very first time and um, they're raising their capital. They have uh, alignment because they want to build a track record. So. Maybe there's uh, an opportunity here, and uh, Shar mentioned secondaries, uh, distressed debt, emerging markets for diversification. There are many, many different opportunities where investors could look at if you, um, and, and then historically we've seen the performance from global financial crisis, and then we had all the quantitative easing that private equity, at least um, in uh, between 2015 and now 19, I saw some numbers that median return was 17% on private. Yeah. Equity. And the thing is that private equity serves a purpose because it is, this, as we refer to it as the shadow banking system. So the banks cannot provide, you know, the help to um, companies themselves. And they don't have, they don't have the, um, 
the resources to do it. And in this case, it's very difficult for them to be able to do that. So that's private equity steps in to do that. That's basically been the, the, his, the reason for um, private equity. And managers right now are, I, there's one that I know that had a deal that was starting, they, they were almost completing that deal uh, when COVID happened. And it was gonna really add to the portfolio. It was gonna add to the return for its investors. And then they had to actually, um, they had to end that deal. It was going to be a very large deal, and they had to then decide not to do it. And there, and that was the best decision given what was happening because it was in the real estate sector, and it also had to do with multi-family housing. And that was that is one of the things that has just hit so so um, hard during this pandemic. And so they had to pivot. And so that's just another example. Can, can I just um, and not to belabor this point, Neil, but I think Jyoti brought up a good point between funds that have existed for a while and emerging or newer managers. Um, actually, I, I think the, the challenge of making these tough calls is in both portfolios. I've talked to smaller and newer managers who um, had a lot of uh, momentum in their portfolios and now, you know, despite their best efforts, their performance probably will be challenged. So I think that goes then to sort of how fundraising, you know, some, some funds are going to have closings that are going to be delayed. Um, and some funds are going to be launching later, which you know, to some extent is easier, obviously, for a larger manager that can afford it. But for these newer managers, I think there can be a big disparity in how much capital will be raised by those smaller managers. And if you hired right. you're going to get there. But if um, you're trying to come out, there's some tough decisions to be made. And there's even discussion that this whole situation where private equity will probably benefit somewhat in terms of an opportunity to reinvest in the companies um, going forward. But will that be all then kind of encapsulated in the larger managers? And will the smaller managers really have sort of their share of the fundraising? Right. And that's what happened with the manager that, that we both know that they were supposed to close and uh, have their first close in March. Uh, well, I, I should say their final close in March of this year. Um, they had already had some hard circle of money that would have gotten them up to about 200 million. And because of COVID, everything just slowed down. It came to a halt, actually. So they're hoping by the fall that folks will be able to meet to, uh, together, have in, or at least have investment committee meetings, finish up their due diligence, and so that they can have their close. But, you know, and they are, you know, a smaller manager. And so it's directly impacted them. One thing I wanted to mention anecdotally here is because I am raising capital for mostly smaller funds, um, I have never been so busy. Usually nobody wants to talk to a placement agent um, and because times are so good, but even the best track record, even funds with the best track record, they are reaching out and saying, do you have any bandwidth? Because it's all about what I call TLC, those trusted long-term commitments and connections that you have you have a relationship, that's what's going to help you in these COVID times because everybody knows we have uh, Zoom fatigue <laughs> uh, and, and uh, you know, there's so many things that you're balancing in your home. And so it becomes really important who, what, who are the people in your networks that you can rely on and communicate with. So it's really a long-term business and it's based on trust and um, transparency. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's awesome. Um, you talk about Zoom fatigue, you know, I don't, when we open back up, you know, I, I'm getting used to getting dressed 20 minutes before I have to be at work, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's all, oh, that's gonna go back, so. <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, we've got, we're at 12.55. Let's go to, um, we've got a little bit of time. We, we wanna stay on time, but I wanna, Here's a question from Travis Alley. He's a 2018 A&M grad, by the way. So good that you're here, Travis. Here Here's his question. If PE funds are now an option for employees to select in their 401k, how do you all anticipate fund managers communicating with and educating these employees who have likely not been exposed to such investments in the past? So I'm happy to chime in here because this is an area that I feel really strongly about. I think um, the ability to invest retirement assets into private markets is 
obviously difficult. Um, it's very sophisticated, but it also is a differentiator because up until this point, um, most people have only been able to have access to public markets. Um, for some time, uh, some wealthy and sophisticated individuals have been doing it, but a certain uh, regulatory opinion came out where now it's becoming more common. I think the way this is mostly going to work, um, from my experience, we had a $3 billion DC 401k plan at my old um, organization, is really as part of an asset allocation package. So when we were talking about institutional investors and sort of how they look at private equity, it's part of a diversified um, portfolio. And so many target date funds or other types of uh, programs like that will offer solutions. But I think having it be a standalone product by itself would require um, someone who honestly has a lot more expertise in this space and probably has to really understand the risk that they're taking. I think for the average person, it should be part of sort of a diversified allocation, which hasn't been available to this point to um, individuals. And I'll chime in as well. Uh, part of the other thing that I do, besides raising capital and ESG consulting, I do a lot of educational webinars through expert networks. Um, one of them is Gershon Lama Group for their members. And uh, it's always on this topic of, you know, talking of some aspect of private equity. We're talking about private equity now. I mean, private markets. So, uh, you know, I've done thing on early stage investing, on looking at how do you fundraise. So there are a lot of opportunities to uh, learn from um, uh, different networks that are available that are teaching about the different asset classes within the private markets. Everything from venture capital to real assets and private equity. Fantastic. Well, I'm looking at our clock. We are right up on the hour. And so I'll just say some closing remarks. Um, first off, to all our guests, we appreciate you all have decided to join us. And, oh, thank you. Did you do that, Jyothi? Did you yep. move that slide? I do. Good job. You are, you are on it. You are on it. All right. So we want to make you aware that we have some more webinars coming up. So the video recording of this webinar will be available. It'll get posted in due, due course by our crack team of marketing who keep an eye on us and keep the trains running on time. Thank you, Kirsten, for doing that. She's the, um, the background. So we're gonna make you aware of that. And also we've got next week, we've got two other webinars coming up. The first one's on the 23rd, Minority Owned, Minority and Women Owned Business Enterprises and the Joint Venture. That should be a good one. And then on Thursday, we've got immigrant rights during the pandemic, litigating habeas petitions for detained immigrants within the Fifth Circuit. And then on J July the 8th, we've got commercial tenant considerations in the age of COVID. So we got a lot more fun down the pike. And I just want to say to our panelists, thank you for coming and sharing your time and your knowledge to our participants. Thanks for chiming in. I hope you got something out of this. Palace, it's been great working with y'all. Y'all are a great bunch. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. So thank you all, and thank you to our panelists. And everybody, you have a great rest of the day. This concludes our private equity webinar. Y'all have a good rest of the day and a productive week. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Thank all you. All right. Uh, thank good you job. Much. All right. Bye-bye.